Hello Internet and welcome to CodePick. In this video, we will be going through some of the fundamental concepts of MobX so you can get started on building your next web or mobile app easily and quickly. So I hope you are excited and let's get started. A quick note here, this video is for those who are completely new to MobX and want to get started quickly by learning the most fundamental concepts. I won't be integrating MobX with any framework or libraries like React, Vue or Angular. So this is purely MobX and only requirement to follow along is the basic understanding of JavaScript. So let's head over to the MobX official docs to know the exact definition of MobX. Here under the introduction section, we see it states MobX is a battle tested library that makes state management simple and scalable by transparently applying functional reactive programming. Now that was a lot of technical terms in one statement. I will break it down so you can understand those terms easily. For one, we know that MobX is a library and can be used with any framework or other libraries of your choice. Next, it's simple and scalable and those are the two reasons why you choose MobX in the first place. And finally, it is able to achieve this by applying functional reactive programming. This is a concept which we will explore throughout this video. But before we move on, I would like to talk about state management because if you are a junior developer, the concept of state management can be a bit confusing and even if you are a seasoned pro, just stick around for a quick refresher and I promise you it makes understanding MobX a lot easier. We can all agree that the UI you see and manipulate on the screen is the result of painting a visual representation of data. To prove my point, let me just real quick jump into StackBlitz. You can find the link to this in the description below in case you want to follow along. This is a very simple item list example that is scaffolded using the create react app. Here you see we have an array containing three items that is product 1, product 2 and product 3. The way I print this value on the screen is by creating a list component that maps over the each items and list item component that receives the individual item and just displays them. Finally we have a simple x mark to denote a remove button. I didn't put much effort into styling so please bear with me on this one. The reason we are going through this is because I want you to understand one important concept that is data takes a pivotal role in describing our UI. Handling the structure and managing the changes that can happen to this data is what we commonly refer to as state management. State is just a synonym for the client data that is resident on the UI. As the complexity of the UI increases, when working on complex object, more state is accumulated on the client. It gets to a point where the state becomes the ultimate source of truth for whatever we see on the user's screen. This approach to UI development where we evaluate the importance of the client state has become one of the biggest shift in the front-end world. There is an interesting equation that captures the relationship between the UI and the state. That is, UI is a function of the state. Here, the function is a transformation function that is applied to the state that produces the corresponding UI. In fact, we can say that given the same state, the function always produces the same UI. Since we are using React in this case, we can modify the equation as follows. The virtual DOM is the function of the props and the states. What it means is, if we take a look at our list item component, you can see that all it does is prints the name of the item that it receives as a prop from the list component. Our itemList.config can be thought of as our state for the application because as soon as I add a fourth product and I update the value, you see our UI changes automatically and it makes sense, right? because we have changed our data in the state of our application. However, the preceding equation is only giving us half the story of the UI. It's true that the visual representation is derived from the state, but it does not account for the user operation that occurs on the UI. 
If you have noticed, we have completely ignored the user in the equation. After all, the interface is not just used to visually represent data, but to allow the user to manipulate that data. This is where I would like to introduce you to the concept of actions that represent these user operations which result in a change in the state. Actions can be thought of as command that you invoke as a result of various input events that are fired. These actions cause a change in the state which is then reflected back on the UI. We can think of them like this. Let us assume the user clicks the button in our UI. The UI does not change the state directly, but instead does it via a message passing system by firing actions. The action encapsulates the parameters that are required to cause an appropriate change in state. The UI is responsible for capturing various kinds of user events and translating them into one or more actions that are then fired to change the state. When the state changes, it notifies all its observers or subscribers of the change. As we know, the UI is one of the most important subscriber that is notified. When that happens, it re-renders and updates the new state. This system of data flow from the state into the UI is always unidirectional and has become the important cornerstone of state management and the modern UI development. One of the biggest benefits of this approach is that it becomes easy to grasp how the UI is kept in sync with the changing data. It also clearly separates the responsibility between rendering and data changes. Here, we can see that for every item in the list, we have an X mark to remove the item and once I click on it, you can see that the item was instantly removed from the UI and it clearly follows the pattern we have just seen a while back. When I interacted with the UI by clicking the X mark, I triggered an action that is delete product. This takes the item ID as its only parameter and removes the object that ID from the array. So our action has changed the state by removing an item from it. We update the state by doing this dot set state and passing the new product list value to the previous product list in the state. This has successfully updated our state. This change in the state notifies our UI because if you remember our UI is the biggest subscriber to any change in the state. Now you have a solid understanding of what state management or client data means. We are just one step closer to mastering MobX. But before that we need to think about one thing. In real world we are not just performing synchronous action as you saw in the previous example. You may be downloading data from a server or persisting data back to the server or maybe running a timer and doing something periodically. These are the things that doesn't fit nicely in our data flow model that I explained for you for so long. Clearly we are missing something, right? Well, you might argue that we could just put these operations inside the UI itself and fire an action at certain times. However, I would argue that it adds additional responsibility to the UI complicating its operation and also making it difficult to test. That also means if we start handling operations in the UI, it would have more than one reason to change the state and that's not good. These opposing forces are termed as side effects in programming and they are inevitable to avoid as application grows in size. Side effects are a result of some state change and are invoked by responding to the notification coming from the state. Just like the UI, there is a handler we can call the side effect handler that observes or subscribes to the state change notification. Now we can visualize it as follows. Just think of it like this. There can be many side effect handlers in a system and each one of them is an observer of the state. When a part of the state they are observing changes, they will invoke the corresponding side effect. Now, these side effects can also cause a change in the state by firing additional actions. As an example, you could fire an action from the UI to download some data. This results in the state change to some flag, which results in a notification being fired to all the observer. 
A side effect handler that is observing the flag will see the change and trigger a network call to download some data. When the download completes, it will fire an action to update the state with the new data and the model works as we discussed previously. The fact that side effect can also fire actions to update the state is an important detail that happens in completing the loop around the managing state. With these concepts in mind, we are now ready to enter the world of MobX. I would like to give you a taste of MobX and its simplicity before we jump into building complex application with MobX. So if you want to follow along, just head over to the stackblitz.com and scroll down until you see something like start a new workspace and click on TypeScript. Now that our project is loaded, let's clear out everything that is there in the index.ts as we will be using the console to view our output. And let me just open up the console real quick. With that done, all we need to do before we can get started is simply install MobX. And in order to do that, we click on the dependency tab on our left and enter MobX and hit return to install the package. Note that the version of MobX at the current time of recording is 5.15.4 and by the time you are viewing this may vary but what I am about to show you is the basic and should work on any version of MobX. With that said, let's get started on our first MobX terminology. We know that state is the epicenter of all the things happening in our UI. MobX provides a core building block called observable that represents the reactive state of your application. Any JavaScript type can be used to create an observable. So let's first import observable from MobX. That was simple, right? Now let's create a cart object that has two properties, item count and modified date. So we could do something like this. Let count equal to observable, which is an API provided by MobX and within the MobX API, I pass an object containing item count which is initially set to 0 and modified date which is set to new date. As the name suggests, an observable is a MobX API which observes for any change in the value of our cart object. Congratulations, you have successfully created an observable on your first JavaScript object. Now let's console log the number of items in the cart and pass cart.item count into the console log like this. Once that is done, on the console on the right, you see we get 0 and it is as expected. Let's check what happens when we increment the value of item count by doing something like cart.item count plus 1. You still see that the number of items on the screen is still 0, right? And that is not what we are expecting. We are expecting the value of the item count to be 1. So what we can do is copy the above console log and paste it after we have updated the item count. We see that immediately a console log on the right with the item count set to 1 appears. I know that some of you may argue that we have just updated a property on our object and console logging the value right after the update will show the current value and MobX did not do anything here. By now, we realize that observable alone cannot make an interesting system. We also need their counterparts, the observers. Observers are those API which observe for any state change in our application and update the UI accordingly. MobX gives you three different kinds of observers, each tailor-made for use cases you will encounter in your application. The core observers are autorun, reaction and when APIs. We will look into each one of them later on in detail but for now we'll stick with autorun. First let's import autorun from MobX. Down here let me clear out the console log and then call autorun and to it as a callback pass the console log we just cleared. And you see immediately we get two console log on the right. One for the initial case when the item count was zero and the second case when the item count was updated to 1. So the autorun API takes a function as its input and runs it once the page is loaded and runs the function anytime the value of the observable is changed. 
So in our case, we see that the auto run API was run the very first time our web page loaded and hence we display the value of zero in the console on our right. It was run once more when we updated the value of item count and hence we see the value of one on the right. Congratulations once again. You just mastered the second basic feature of MobX, Observers. There is one important rule in MobX that is regarding how to update the observers in MobX. If you see here in the example, what we are doing is directly manipulating the cart object by accessing it and updating the value of item count. Just keep in mind, it never ever do that. I just showed you because I want you to know that it is completely possible to manipulate the MobX store directly but it is never advised to do so. Then how do we solve this problem? To solve this problem, MobX provides another API called action. Let's first clear out this value. Then we create a new variable called increment count that holds the value that is written from our action. Now we call our action API and to it in the callback pass increment card dot item count. Once we do that, you see nothing happens because we have just initialized our increment count function. We need to run it so that it takes some effects. We could do that by simply calling increment count down here. Once we do that, we get the appropriate result on the console on our right. Congratulations for the final time because you have mastered the triads of MobX, observables, observers and action. These three features of MobX is what allows you to easily manage your state and enforce the concept of unidirectional data flow. With that said, we will go deep into each of these concepts and I will explain to you how to use them at their best as your application skills over time. That is the end of the video guys. I hope you liked it. If so, drop a like and subscribe. See you in the next video. Happy coding until then.